Section 5 of A Budget of Christmas Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. Stave 5. The End of It. Yes, the bedpost was his own. The bed was his own, and the room was his own. Best and happiest of all, the time before him was his own, to make amends in. He was so fluttered and so glowing with his good intentions, that his broken voice would scarcely answer to his call. He had been sobbing violently in his conflict with the spirit, and his face was wet with tears. "'They are not torn down!' cried Scrooge, folding one of his bed curtains in his arms. "'They are not torn down! Rings and all! They are here!' i am here the shadows of the things that have been may be dispelled they will be i know they will he had frisked into the sitting-room and was now standing there perfectly winded there's the saucepan that the gruel was in cried scrooge starting off again and going round the fireplace there's the door by which the ghost of jacob marley entered there's the corner where the ghost of christmas present sat there's the window where i saw the wandering spirits it's all right it's all true it happened <laughs> really for a man who had been out of practice for so many years it was a splendid laugh a most illustrious laugh the father of a long long line of brilliant laughs <laughs> i don't know what day of the month it is said scrooge i don't know how long i have been among the spirits i don't know anything i'm quite a baby never mind i don't care i'd rather be a baby hello Hoopa! hello there he was checked in his transports by the churches ringing out the lustiest peals he had ever heard clash clash hammer ding dong bell bell dong ding hammer clang clash oh glorious glorious running to the window he opened it and put out his head what's to-day cried scrooge calling downward to a boy in sunday clothes who perhaps had loitered in to look about him eh returned the boy with all his might of wonder what's to-day my fine fellow said scrooge to-day replied the boy why uh, christmas day it's christmas day scrooge said to himself i haven't missed it the spirits have done it all in one night uh, hello my fine fellow hello returned the boy uh, do you know the polters in the next street but one at the corner scrooge inquired i should hope i did replied the lad an intelligent boy said scrooge a remarkable boy do you know whether they've sold the prize turkey that was hanging up there it's hanging there now replied the boy is it said scrooge go and buy it walker exclaimed the boy no no said scrooge i am in earnest go and buy it and tell em to bring it here that i may give them the directions where to take it come back with the man and i'll give you a shilling the boy was off like a shot i'll send it to bob cratchit's whispered scrooge rubbing his hands and splitting with a laugh <laughs> i shan't know who sends it it's twice the size of tiny tim the hand in which he wrote the address was not a steady one but write it he did somehow and went downstairs to open the street door ready for the coming of the poulterer's man the chuckle with which he paid for the turkey and the chuckle with which he recompensed the boy were only to be exceeded by the chuckle with which he sat down breathless in his chair and chuckled till he cried he dressed himself all in his best and got out into the streets the people were by this time pouring forth as he had seen them with the ghost of christmas present and walking with his hands behind him scrooge regarded every one with a delighted smile he looked so irresistibly pleasant in a word that three or four good-humoured fellows said good morning sir a merry christmas to you and scrooge said often afterward that of all the blithe sounds he ever heard 
those were the blithest in his ears he had not gone far when coming on toward him he beheld the portly gentleman who had walked into his counting-house the day before and said scrooge and marley's i believe it sent a pang across his heart to think how this old gentleman would look upon him when they met but he knew what path lay straight before him and he took it uh, my dear sir said scrooge quickening his pace and taking the old gentleman by his hands how do you do i hope you succeeded yesterday it was very kind of you a merry christmas to you sir a uh, master scrooge yes said scrooge that is my name and i fear it may not be pleasant to you allow me to ask your pardon and will you have the goodness here scrooge whispered in his ear oh lord bless me cried the gentleman as if his breath were taken away my dear scrooge are you serious if you please said scrooge not a farthing less a great many back payments are included in it i assure you will you do me that favour my dear sir said the other shaking his hands with him i do not know what to say to such munif don't say anything retorted scrooge come and see me will you come and see me i will cried the gentleman and it was clear he meant to do it thank ye said scrooge i am much obliged to you i thank you fifty times bless you he went to church and walked about the streets and watched the people hurrying to and fro and patted the children on the head and looked down into the kitchens of houses and up to the windows and found everything could yield him pleasure he had never dreamed that any walk that anything could give him so much happiness in the afternoon he turned his steps toward his nephew's house he passed the door a dozen times before he had the courage to go up and knock but he made a dash and did it uh, is your master at home my dear said scrooge to the girl nice girl very uh, yes sir where is he said scrooge he's in the dining-room sir along with mistress i'll show you upstairs if you please thank ye he knows me said scrooge with his hand already on the dining-room lock i'll go in here my dear he turned it gently and sidled his face in round the door they were looking at the table which was spread out in great array for these young housekeepers are always nervous on such points and like to see that everything is right uh, fred said scrooge why bless my soul cried fred who's that it's i your uncle scrooge i have come to dinner will you let me in fred let him in it is a mercy he didn't shake his arm off he was at home in five minutes nothing could be heartier but he was early at the office next morning oh he was early there if he could only be there first and catch bob cratchit coming late that was the thing he had set his heart upon and he did it yes he did the clock struck nine no bob a quarter past no bob he was full eighteen minutes and a half behind his time scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might see him come into the tank his hat was off before he opened the door his comforter too he was on his stool in the jiffy driving away with his pen as if he were trying to overtake nine o'clock hello growled scrooge in his accustomed voice as near as he could feign it what do you mean by coming here at this time of day i am very sorry sir said bob i am behind my time you are repeated scrooge yes i think you are step this way sir if you please it's only once a year sir pleaded bob appearing from the tank it shall not be repeated i was making rather merry yesterday sir now i'll tell you what my friend said scrooge i am not going to stand this sort of thing any longer and therefore i am about to raise your salary 
a merry christmas bob said scrooge with an earnestness that could not be mistaken as he clapped him on the back a merrier christmas bob my good fellow than i have given you for many a year i'll raise your sally and endeavor to assist your struggling family and we will discuss your affairs this very afternoon make up the fires and buy another coal scuttle before you dot another eye bob cratchit scrooge was better than his word he did it all and infinitely more and to tiny tim who did not die he was a second father he became as good a friend as good a master and as good a man as the good old city knew or any other good old city town or borough in the good old world some people laughed to see the alteration in him but he let them laugh and little heeded them for he was wise enough to know that nothing ever happened on this globe for good at which some people did not have their fill of laughter in the outset and knowing that such as these would be blind anyway he thought it quite as well that they should wrinkle up their eyes and grins as had the melody in less attractive forms his own heart laughed and that was quite enough for him he had no further intercourse with spirits but lived upon the total abstinence principle ever afterward and it was always said of him that he knew how to keep christmas well if any man alive possessed the knowledge may that truly be said of us and all of us and so as tiny tim observed god bless us every one End of section 5 Section 6 of A Budget of Christmas Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson The Christmas Babe by Margaret E. Sangster we love to think of bethlehem that little mountain town to which on earth's first christmas day our blessed lord came down a lowly manger for his bed the cattle near in stall there cradled close in mary's arms he slept the lord of all if we had been in bethlehem we too had hasted fain to see the babe whose little face knew neither care nor pain like any little child of ours he came unto his own through cross and shame before him stretched his pathway to his throne if we had dwelt in bethlehem we would have followed fast and where the star had led our feet have knelt ere dawn was past our gifts our songs our prayers had been an offering as he lay the blessed babe of bethlehem in mary's arms that day now breaks the latest christmas morn again the angels sing and far and near the children throng their happy hymns to bring all heaven is stirred all earth is glad for down the shining way the lord who came to bethlehem comes yet on christmas day end of section six Section 7 of A Budget of Christmas Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Debbie Baker Robinson, Davy, Florida. A Western Christmas in the Old Days by Mrs. W. H. Corning. Christmas week there was no school, but such a succession of dining days and visiting days and day parties and night parties that Fanny, who looked forward to the week as a season of rest, thought that the regular routine of school duties would be less fatiguing. Christmas at La Belle Prairie was the one jubilee of the year, something to be talked about for six months beforehand and to be remembered as long after it was a time of feasting and recreation for both master and servant days before preparations commenced in the kitchen various smells issued from thence savory smells of boiled baked and roasted meats and sweet delicious smells of warm pastry and steaming cakes aunt tibby was rolling pie crust or stirring cake all day long and the chopping of sausage meat 
the pounding of spices, and the beating of eggs were constantly heard. Everything was carried on with the greatest secrecy. The children were all kept out of the kitchen, and when something good was to be transferred therefrom to Miss Caroline's storeroom, Aunt Tibby came sailing in, holding it high above the reach of the curious little heads. I don't care, said Cal. There's six pound cakes all in a row on the storeroom shelf. I see em when Ma opened the door, and Marthy says one of em got currants in it, and there's a little shout thar roasted whole. Oh, how I wish Christmas was come! Coming suddenly upon Maud one day, Fanny found her with her apron half full of bran while her fingers were busily at work upon a few pieces of faded silk. Maud tried to hide them at first, but finding by Fanny's question of, What is it, Maud? that it was too late, she had looked up with a tired, flushed face and said, Miss Fanny, don't you tell now, will you? I'm making a pincushion for Aunt Phoebe, but it won't come square all I can do. It acts awfully. Let me see what the trouble is, said Fanny, and sitting down she examined the poor cushion, which indeed under Maud's hands was not soon likely to come into shape. You see, said Maud, I want to give Auntie a Christmas gift, and I thought a cushion would be so nice, cause her old one that she wears pinned to her waist, you know, has burst a great hole, and the brand keeps tumbling out. I'm going to make her a right nice one, only I wish was brighter, cause Auntie likes red and yellow and all them so bad. Fanny searched her piece bag and brought forth bits of gay ribbon, the sight of which threw Maud into ecstasies of delight. Then giving up the morning to the job, she cut and planned and fitted and basted together, getting all in order so that Maud could do the sewing herself. Auntie wouldn't think half so much of it if I didn't, said the child. Well and faithfully, Maud performed her labor of love, giving up her much prized runs on the prairie and resisting all the children's entreaties to play with them till the Christmas gift was finished. It was no small task, for Maud most heartily hated to sew, and her fingers were anything but nimble in the operation. I always did despise to sew, Miss Fanny, she said, but I'm going to make this cushion for Auntie anyhow. It was finished at last, and, as Maud expressed it, was just as beautiful as it could be. There never was a prouder, happier child. She did not thank Fanny in words for her assistance, but that night she came softly behind her, and putting her arms around her neck gave her an earnest kiss, a proceeding which called forth an exclamation of surprise from Mrs. Catlett, for Maud was very cherry of her caresses. Christmas morning came, and long before daylight, every child upon the place, both black and white, was up ready to march in Christmas. There had been mysterious preparations the night before, such as the hiding of tin pans and glass bottles under the bed, and the faint tooting of an old horn heard down at the quarters, as though someone was rehearsing a part. Fanny was also astonished by an application from little Darky Tom for permission to use her school bell, the said cow tinkler not being remarkable for sweetness of sound. Oh, yes, Tom, you may take it, but what can you want of it? Couldn't tell no ways, Miss Fanny, said Tom with a grin. Maybe Miss Fanny know in the morning. Morning did indeed bring an explanation of the mystery. Assembling in the yard, the children marshaled themselves into marching order, Maud, of course, being captain and taking the lead, bearing an old tin horn, while little black Tom brought up the rear with Fanny's unfortunate cowbell. In this order, they commenced marching in Christmas, to the music of the horn, the beating of tin pans, the rattling of bits of iron and pieces of wood, the jingling of bells and the clapping of hands. Into the house and upstairs to the very doors of the sleeping rooms, they all marched with their horrid din. It was received with tolerable good humor by all but Nanny, who, deprived of her morning nap by the tumult, raved at the juvenile disturbers of the peace and finally threw her shoes at them as they stood on the stairway. These were directly seized upon as trophies, 
and carried off in triumph to the quarters where the young performers went through with the same operations christmas gift christmas gift was the first salutation from the servants this morning and it was well worth while to give them some trifling present were it only to hear their extravagant expressions of gratitude and delight it was impossible to forget for a moment that it was christmas one could see it in the faces of the servants released for a whole week from their daily tasks and rejoicing in the prospect of dances and parties and visits to friends and kindred on distant plantations the children too with their boisterous merriment and constant talk about the holidays seemed determined to bear it in mind and the great dinner the one dinner of the year in the preparation of which aunt tibby had exercised all her skill this in itself seemed to proclaim that it was christmas oh miss fanny said little joy don't you wish christmas lasted the whole year round the short december day was fast drawing to a close as a party of four rode leisurely along the road crossing la belle prairie the ladies though scarcely recognizable in their close hoods long blue cotton riding skirts and thick gloves were none other than miss nancy catlett and our friend fanny while their attendants were mr chester the town gentleman and massa day catlett who had come over from his new home in kansas on purpose to enjoy the christmas festivities on the prairie one of those night parties of which nanny had talked so much was to come off at colonel turner's and this was the place of their destination in accordance with the customs of society in these parts they were to remain until the next day and accordingly black viney rode a little in the rear mounted upon old poke neck and bearing sundry carpet bags and valises containing the ladies party dresses just at dusk our party reached their journey's end and dismounting one by one from the horse block in front of the house they walked up the road and were met in the porch by miss bell turner nanny's particular friend this young lady with long curls and a very slender waist performed the duties of hostess in a free and easy manner ushering the gentlemen into the parlor where a fire was blazing on the hearth while the ladies with their attendants were conducted upstairs to the dressing room here a dozen or more were engaged in the mysteries of the toilet braiding twisting and curling while as many servants were flying about stumbling over each other and creating the most dire confusion in their efforts to supply the wants of their respective mistresses the beds and chairs were covered with dresses capes ribbons curling irons flowers combs and brushes and all the paraphernalia of the toilet while the ladies themselves kept up a continual stream of conversation with each other and their attendants into this scene nanny entered with great spirit shaking hands all round and introducing fanny she hastily threw off her bonnet and shawl and bidding viney unpack the things she set about dressing in good earnest how nice to get here so early she said now we can have a chance at the glass and plenty of room to move about in fanny wondered what she called plenty of room but had yet to learn the signification of the term when applied to the dressing room of a western party thicker and faster came the arrivals and it being necessary that each lady should undergo a thorough transformation in dress before making her appearance downstairs the labor and confusion necessary to bring this about can be imagined such hurryings to and fro such knockings down and pickings up such scolding and laughing in short such a babel of sounds as filled the room for an hour or two fanny had never heard before completing her own toilet as soon as possible she seated herself upon one of the beds and watched the proceedings with great interest you suki bring me some more pins directly oh please miss ellen mind my wreath jewel how much longer are you going to keep the wash bowl dar now miss eveline done get her coat all wet did you know tom walton was here i see him in the passage miss bell that's my starch bag there now don't them slippers fit beautiful why don't that girl come back oh liza just fasten up my dress that's a dear girl 
Come, girls, do hurry. We shan't be dressed tonight. How it was all brought about, Fanny could not tell. But at last the ladies were dressed, the last sash pinned, and the last curl adjusted. Dresses of thin material cut low in the neck with short sleeves seemed to be the order of the night, which, with wreaths and bunches of artificial flowers in the hair, gave the ladies a handsome appearance. With Miss Bell at the head, they all descended to the parlor and found the gentlemen strolling about, employing themselves as they could, till the night's amusements commenced. And, indeed, both ladies and gentlemen manifested such eagerness to adjourn to the playroom that the signal was soon given, and they proceeded forthwith to a log building in the yard, formerly used as a schoolroom. Games soon commenced and were carried on with great vigor, the young people making up in activity what was lacking in gracefulness of motion. Game after game was made out, the ladies vying with each other to see who should laugh the most, while those who were left chatted gaily together in groups, or tried their powers of fascination upon some long-limbed specimen of humanity. "'What calls the gentlemen upstairs so frequently?' inquired Fanny, innocently, as groups of two and three disappeared up the steps leading to the room above. "'You are not aware, then, what a formidable rival the ladies have up in the loft?' said Mr. Chester gravely, though there was a comical expression about the corners of his mouth. No, indeed. Well, I only hope you may not witness the overpowering influence sometimes exerted by this same rival, said Mr. Chester. But honestly, Miss Hunter, there is serious danger that some of these light-footed young gentlemen may, ere long, be obliged to relinquish their places in our party all through the attractions presented to them up yonder. I don't know in the least what you mean. In plain words, then, they are talking about horses up there. Men are crazy over horses, you know. Are you in earnest, Mr. Chester? Certainly I am. It would not answer, I suppose, for ladies to intrude upon their modest retirement, or I could convince you in a moment. How can you joke about it, Mr. Chester? I think it is perfectly scandalous. Well, it is bad enough, said her companion more gravely. One living at the West becomes accustomed to such things. I never will, said Fanny. If I had known these Christmas parties countenanced such impoliteness, I would have stayed at home. A set supper, Nanny had several times expressed a hope that Mrs. Turner would provide and she was not disappointed. The long table was bountifully spread with the substantials of this life, and though not in the style of an entertainment in Fifth Avenue, it was admirably suited to the guests who partook of it. A roasted shoat graced each end of the board, a side of bacon the center, while salted beef cut in thin slices with pickles and cheese constituted the side dishes. Hot coffee, cornbread, and biscuit were passed to each guest, and a piece of pound cake and a little preserved fruit for dessert. There was plenty of laughter and hearty joking at the table, and the flushed faces and increased volubility of the gentlemen gave too certain evidence of the truth of Mr. Chester's assertions. The langish day maun a an end, says the old Scotch proverb, Odd it was with a sigh of relief that Fanny at last saw Uncle Jake lay down the tortured fiddle, and the guests with lingering steps and wishful eyes retired to seek the few hours of repose that were left of the night. Confusion worse confounded reigned for a time in the apartment appropriated to the ladies' use, and the numerous couches spread upon the floor increased the difficulty of navigation. At last, when quiet seemed restored, and Fanny was sinking into a peaceful sleep. She was aroused by her neighbors in an adjoining bed, three young ladies who declared that they were all but starved and must have something to eat before they could go to sleep. One of the black women was dispatched to the storeroom for some slices of cold bacon, and, sitting up in bed with the candle before them, they made a hearty repast. "'Of course you can't eat half as much as you want at table,' said one of the young ladies apologetically. One always wants to appear delicate-like before the gentleman. What 
in goodness name nan made breakfast so late said dave the next morning or rather noon as they were returning home i thought one while we wasn't going to get any why you see they hadn't any wheat flour in the house for the biscuit said nanny and they had to send three miles over the prairie to mr john turner's to borrow some twenty people invited to stay overnight and no flour in the house said fanny in amazement it rather shocks your yankee ideas of looking out ahead miss hunter said mr chester laughing we are used to such things out this way oh miss fanny people can't remember everything you know said nanny bell says they never thought a word about it till this morning end of a western christmas in the old days recording by debbie baker robinson davy florida section eight of a budget of christmas tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Joe's Search for Santa Claus by Irving Bachelor. A story, my child. Well, there's none that I know as good as the story about little Joe. He lived with his mother just under the eaves of a tenement high where the telegraph weaves its highway of wire that everywhere goes and makes the night musical when the wind blows their home had no father the two were bereft of all but their appetites those never left joe's grew with his thought a day never passed he spent not in hunger to make the food last and days when his mother silently went and stood by the windows joe knew what it meant they ate nothing for supper the words were so sad that somehow they drowned all the hunger he had and surely god's miracles never have ceased joe's hunger grew less when his sorrows increased when the coal ran out in winter's worst storm the fire burnt the harder that kept their hearts warm their windows revealed many wonderful sights long acres of roofing and high flying kites at sunset the great vault of heaven aglow the lining of gold on the clouds hanging low the cross on the top of st mary's high tower ablaze with the light of that magical hour and still as the arrows of light slanted higher the last thing in sight was the great cross of fire each day as it vanished the history old of christ's crucifixion was reverently told to him the boy learned to confide all his woes but oftenest prayed for a new set of clothes since those that he wore didn't fit him at all the coat was too large and the trousers too small and joe looked so queer from his head to his feet it grieved his proud soul to be seen in the street and sometimes he cherished a secret desire to own a hand sled or to build a bonfire but reached one conclusion by various routes he could have better fun with a new pair of boots he thought how the old pair when shiny and whole had squeaked in a way that delighted his soul and remembrance grew sad as he strutted around and tried hard but vainly to waken that sound the day before christmas brought trouble for joe a thousand times worse twas a terrible blow to hear that old santa claus god of his dreams would not come that year 
with his fleet-footed teams he'd seen them why once of a night's witching hour he saw them jump over the cross on the tower and scamper away over the snow-covered roofs his heart beating time to the sound of their hoofs not coming this year santa claus must be dead he thought as with sad tears he crept into bed and as he lay thinking the long strings of wire sang low in the wind like a deep sounding lyre and joe caught the notes of this solemn refrain he'll not come again no he'll not come again and oh how the depths of his spirit were stirred by thoughts that were born of the music he heard how cold were the winds and they sang in their strife of storms yet to come in the winters of life they mocked him but mark how the faith of the child stood firm as a fortress its hope undefiled for still the boy thought that if santa claus knew how great were their needs and their comforts how few he would come and at length when the first rays of light had fathomed the infinite depths of the night and brightened the windows joe cautiously crept out of bed and he dressed while his mother still slept and down the long stairways on tiptoe he ran then out in the snow with the will of a man he went looking hither and thither because poor boy he was trying to find santa claus he hurried along through the snow-burdened street as if the good angels were guiding his feet and as the sun rose and the heavens apace a radiance fell on his uplifted face that came from the cross gleaming far overhead a symbol of hope for the living and dead a moment he looked at the great house of prayer then slyly peeked in to see what was there and entering softly he wandered at will through pathways of velvet deserted and still and saw the light grow on a wonderful scene of ivy twined columns and arches of green and back of the rail where the clergyman knelt he sat on the cushions to see how they felt how soft was that velvet he stroked with his hand but when he lay down oh the feeling was grand and while he was musing the walls seemed to sway and slowly the windows went moving away what ho there he comes with his big pack and all down the sunbeams that slope from the high windowed wall and joe tried to speak but could not if he died when santa claus came and sat down by his side a tenement boy humph, he probably swears joe trembled and tried hard to think of his prayers he lifted joe's eyelids he patted his brow and said he is not a bad boy anyhow but hark there is music a deep swelling sound is sweeping on high as if heavenward bound and suddenly waking joe saw kneeling there the rector long robed who was reading a prayer provide for the fatherless children said he the widowed the helpless the bond and the free the rector stops praying his face wears a frown a ragged young gammon is pulling his gown i knowed you would come said the boy half in fright i knowed you would come i was watchin all night say what are ye goin to give mother and me let me see what tis santa claus please let me see the rector looked down into joe's honest face 
and a great wave of feeling swept over the place and tenderly laying his hand on joe's head he turned to the people and solemnly said we pray that the poor may be sheltered and fed and we leave it to heaven to furnish the bread ye know while he feedeth the fowls in the air the children of mankind he leaves to man's care and kissing joe's face the preacher said then of such is the kingdom of heaven amen that day santa claus came to many a door he'd forgotten to call at the evening before was little joe lucky well now you are right and the wires sang merrily all the next night end of section eight recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida Section 9 of A Budget of Christmas Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corinne Clayton. Angela's Christmas. Then it is yes, Father dear, said Angela, looking across the breakfast table with a smile. It was her mother's smile, and the girl had filled her mother's vacant chair for more than a year. The eyes of the father and daughter met, and Angela knew, before a word was said, that she had conquered. "'I hate to see you at your age beginning to worry over these things,' Ephraim Fraser said regretfully. "'Let the old women take care of the charities, dear. You keep on dancing in the sunshine a while longer, daughter.' Angela's smile grew graver, but not less sweet. "'I am twenty, dear,' she said, "'and too old to dance all the time. "'And I cannot help thinking, you know. "'And it's no use, Papa dear. "'I must do something. "'It is yes, isn't it?' "'You are sure you won't mind being criticized and ridiculed?' "'Quite sure,' answered Angela." "'And sure you won't take your failures and disappointments to heart too deeply?' "'Quite sure I can bear them bravely,' answered the girl. "'If only one, just one, of those poor creatures may be helped "'and lifted up and brought out of darkness, it will be worth trying for.' "'And what does Robert Johns say about it?' "'A glow kindled in Angela's face.' "'Robert is in perfect sympathy with me,' she said softly. "'Then again, this time having risen and gone around to his side, "'to speak with her face against the old banker's smoothly shaven cheek. "'It is yes, isn't it, Daddy dear?' "'Well, yes. Only you must go slow, dear. You are not over-strong, you know.' And soon it came to pass that on a vacant lot, hitherto given over to refuse heaps, haunted by stray cats, rag pickers, and vagrant children, in one of the vilest quarters of the metropolis there sprang up, with magic swiftness, a commodious frame building, surrounded by smooth green sod, known in the lower circles as the Locust Street Home, in upper circles, laughingly denominated, Angela's experiment. Angela did not mind. It was mostly good-natured laughter, and many of the laughers ended up lending willing hands and hearts to the cause. It was wonderful how the news spread through the city's purlieu that here was a sanctuary into which cold, hunger, and fatigue dared not intrude, a place where the lowest might enter and be made welcome and go unquestioned his personal rights as carefully respected as though he were one of the four hundred. That was Angela's theory. No man, woman, or child should be compelled to anything. First make their bodies comfortable, then surround them with ennobling influences and examples. Entertain them, arouse them, stimulate them, hold out the helping hand, and leave the rest to God. 
they shall not even be compelled to be clean, she said, laughing. If the beautiful clean bathrooms and clean clothing do not tempt them to cleanliness, then so be it. I will have no rules, only influences. You will see. And people did see and wondered. Sometimes, on warm, pleasant evenings, the spacious, cheerful hall with its tables and chairs would be almost empty. But on nights like that on which this story opens, a dark, cold December night, the seats were apt to be well filled, mostly with slatternly, hard-featured women and dull-faced children who sat staring stolidly about while the music and speaking went on half stupefied by the warmth and tranquillity so foreign to their lives. Outside, a dismal sleet was falling, but from the open door of the vestibule a great sheet of light fell upon the wet pavement, and above it glowed a transparency bearing the words, A Merry Christmas to all! Come in! It was while the singing was going on, led by a high, sweet girl's voice, that a human figure came hobbling out from a side street and stopped short at the very edge of the lighted space. A woman by her dress, an old, old woman, with a seamed, blotchy face, an ugly human wreck, all torn and battered and discolored by the storms of life. Such was old Marge, Loony Marge, as she was called in the haunts that knew her best. Her history? She had forgotten it herself, very likely, and there was no one to know or care. No one in the wide world to care if she should at any moment be trampled to death or slip from the dock into the black river. The garret which lodged her would find another tenant, the children of the gutters another target for their missiles, not that she was worse than others, only that she was old and ugly and sharp of tongue, and the world, even her world, had no use for such as she. For some time this forlorn creature continued to hover on the edge of the lighted space. The sleet had become snow, and already a thin white film covered the pavement, promising a white Christmas, and the cold increased from moment to moment. The woman drew her filthy shawl closer, her jaws chattered, yet she seemed unable to tear herself from the spot. Her eyes, alert under their grey brows as a rat's, were fixed now upon the open door, now upon the transparency, yet she made no motion toward the proffered shelter. Two men, her soot and ragged, stopped near her, and after a moment's consultation, slunk across the square of light and disappeared in the building. As the door was opened, there came a fuller burst of song and a rush of warm air, fragrant with the aroma of coffee and oysters. The old woman's body quivered with desire, food, warmth, rest, all that her miserable frame demanded were there, within easy reach, for the mere asking, nay, for the mere taking. Yet still the devils of stubbornness and spite would not let go their hold upon her. But finally, as a bitter blast swept the snow stinging against her face, she uttered a hoarse snarl and glancing about to see that no jeering eye was upon her, the poor creature crept across the pavement, clambered up the stone steps, and pushing open the door, slipped into the nearest vacant seat. The chairs and benches were unusually well filled. The numbers of women and children were in the foreground. A few men were also present, sitting with their bodies hanging forward, their hats tightly clutched between their knees, their eyes fixed on the floor. The women and children, on the contrary, followed every movement of the young women on the platform with furtive eagerness. The simplicity of attire which Angela and her friends had assumed did not deceive even the tiniest gutter child present. These were ladies, and one and all accorded them the same tribute of genuine, if reluctant, admiration. 
old marge after the embarrassment of the first moment took everything in with one hawk-like glance the christmas greens upon the clean white walls the curtained space in the rear which hid some pleasant mystery the men and women on the platform at the organ sat a young girl leaning upon the now silent keys her face toward the young man who was speaking old marge could not take her eyes from this face white serious sweet set in a halo of pale golden hair the sight of it aroused strange feelings in the bosom of the old outcast fascinated tortured bewildered she sat and gazed it was long since she had thought of her youth this girl reminded her of that forgotten time like a violet flung upon the refuse heap the thought of her own innocent girlhood lay for an instant upon the foul mass of memories accumulated by sixty miserable years i was light-haired too ran old marge's thoughts light-haired and light-complected like her the perfume of that thought breathed across her soul and was gone still she gazed from under her shaggy brows and without meaning to listen found herself hearing what the speaker was saying he was telling without rhetoric or cant the story of christ and with simplicity and tact presenting the lesson of his life this joy of giving of sacrifice for others the young man was saying in his earnest musical voice so far beyond the joy of receiving is within the reach of every human being think of that the poorest man or woman or child who breathes on earth to-night may know this joy may give some pleasure some help some comfort to some fellow creature whether it be a human creature or a dumb beast matters not it is all one in god's sight being an act of love and kindness and sacrifice old marge looked down upon her squalid rags her rough features writhed in a scornful smile that's a lie she muttered what could the likes of me do for anybody i'd like to know still she listened but at last as the warmth stole through her sodden garments and into her chilled veins and the peace of the place penetrated the turbulent recesses of her soul the man's voice became like a voice heard in a dream and the old outcast slept a confused sound greeted her awakening someone was playing the organ jubilantly people were moving about the girls with trays loaded with steaming dishes children were talking and laughing excitedly the curtain had been drawn and a great christmas tree almost blinded her with its splendor she stared about in bewilderment she looked at the tree at the people at her own foul rags a fierce revulsion of feeling swept over her rage shame a desire to get out of sight and to be swallowed up in the darkness and misery which were her proper element seized and mastered her she staggered to her feet a young girl approached her with a tray of tempting food the sight and smell of it goaded the starved creature to madness she could have fallen upon it like a wolf but instead she pushed the girl roughly aside and fumbled dizzily at the doorknob a hand was laid upon her arm the girl with the sweet white face was looking at her with a friendly smile won't you stay and have something warm to eat before going into the cold the girl asked gently old marge shook her hand from her arm no she snarled i don't want nothing let me go with a patient smile angela opened the door i am sorry you won't stay she said softly it would give me great pleasure there is a gift for you on the tree too it is christmas eve you know a hoarse choking sound came from the woman's lips she pushed by into the vestibule angela followed if you should feel differently tomorrow she said in her kind gentle voice 
come here again about eleven o'clock. I shall be here. Without waiting for a reply, she re-entered the hall. A young man, the same who had been speaking, met her at the door. Angela, he exclaimed, you should not be out there in the cold. She smiled absently. Did you see her, Robert? That terrible old woman? Yes, I saw her. A hopeless case, I fear. Angela's eyes kept their absent look. It is awful to see her go away like that, into the cold and snow, hungry and half-clad, she said. The young man leaned nearer. Angela, he whispered, you must not let these things sink into your heart as you do, or you cannot bear the work you have undertaken. As for that old creature, it is terrible to think of her, but she seemed to me beyond our reach. "'But not beyond God's reach through us,' said Angela. "'Meantime, old Marge was facing the storm with rage "'and pain in her face and in her heart. "'The streets were deserted and lighted only by such beams "'as found their way through the dirty windows of shops and saloons. "'From these last came sounds of revelry and contention, "'and at one or another the poor creature paused.' "'listening without fear to the familiar hubbub. "'Should she go in? "'Someone might give her a drink "'to ease for a time the terrible gnawing in her breast. "'Might, yes, but more likely she would be thrust out "'with jeers and curses, and for some reason "'old Marge was in no mood to use the caustic wit "'and ready tongue that were her only weapons. "'So she staggered on until the swarming tenement was reached, stumbled up the five flights of unilluminated stairs, and almost fell headlong into the dismal garret which she called her home. Feeling about in the darkness, she found a match and lit a bit of candle which stopped the neck of an empty bottle. It burned uncertainly, as if reluctant to disclose the scene upon which its light fell. A smoke-stained, sloping ceiling, a blackened floor, a shapeless mattress heaped with rags, a deal box, a rusty stove resting upon two bricks, supporting in its turn an ancient frying pan, a chipped saucer, and a battered tin can from which, when the scavenger business was good, old Marge served afternoon tea. Such were her home and all her personal belongings. There was no fire, nor any means of producing one, but upon the box was spread a piece of paper containing a slice of bread, a soup bone whereto clung some fragments of meat, the gift of a neighbor hardly less wretched than herself. The old woman's eyes glittered at the sight, and seizing the food she sank weakly upon the box and began gnawing at it, but her toothless jaws, stiff with cold, made no impression upon the tough meat and hard crust, and letting them drop to the floor, the poor creature fell to rocking to and fro, whimpering tearlessly like a suffering dog. Strangely enough, within the withered bosom of this most wretched creature there had welled up, from some hidden source of womanly feeling, a passionate self-pity, a no less passionate self-loathing. This was what a moment's contact with all that she had so long abjured, purity, order, gentleness, had brought to pass. That fair young girl, tall, pale, sweet as an Easter lily, stood before her like an incarnate memory, pointing toward the past, the far distant past, when she too was young and pretty and innocent and gay, too pretty and too gay for a poor working girl. That was where the trouble began. I was light-haired too, moaned old March, twisting her withered fingers restlessly, light-haired and light-complected, a pretty girl, and a good girl, too. Not like her, no. How could I be? Little the likes of her knows what the likes of me has to face. Lord. The bit of candle guttered and went out. 
the cold increased it had ceased snowing and a keen wind had risen tearing the clouds into shreds through which the stars gleamed and presently the moon climbed up behind the belfry of the old church across the square and sent one broad white ray through the dingy window and across the floor all at once the great bell began to strike the midnight hour its mingled vibrations filling the garret with tumultuous sounds the vision of the fair girl faded and old marge was herself again a hard bitter rebellious old woman with a burning care where her heart had been and only one thought one desire left in her desperate mind the thought and desire of death in young and passionate days she had often thought of seeking that way out of life's agonies but at its worst there is always some sweetness left in the cup when one is young it was not so now the dregs only had been hers for many a year and she had enough death yes that was best her eyes glittered as she cast a look about the silent room bare even of the means to this end ah the window with an inarticulate cry the woman arose and hobbled along the shining moon ray to the window and threw open the sash awed by the stern beauty of the heavens the splendor of the moon tangled in the lace-like carvings of the belfry as in a net she leaned some moments against the sill looking out and down far below lay the deserted square its white bosom traced with the sharp shadow of the tower with a keen eye old marge measured the distance a sheer descent of fifty feet nothing to break the fall nothing one movement a swift fall and that white surface would be broken by a black shapeless heap a policeman would find it on his next round or some drunken reveller would stumble over it or the good people on their way to early mass ah the seamed countenance lit up suddenly with a malignant joy why not wait until they began to pass those pious respectable people in their comfortable furs and wools and cast herself into their mist a ghastly christmas offering from poverty to riches from sin to virtue this suggestion commended itself highly to her sense of humor with a hoarse chuckle she was about to close the window when a portion of shadow that lay along the chimney showed signs of life and rising on four long and skinny legs became a cat a lean black cat which crept meekly toward the window its phosphorescent eyes gleaming its lank jaws parted in a vain effort to mew startled old marge drew back for an instant then glancing from the animal to the pavement below a brutal cunning a malicious pleasure lit up the witch-like features reaching out one skinny arm she called coaxingly puss puss the cat dragged herself up to the outstretched arm rubbing her lank body caressingly against it the cruel cunning of the face softened suddenly lord muttered old marge if she ain't a tryin to purr well that beats me the poor beast continued its piteous appeal for aid arching its starved frame waving its tail fawning unsuspectingly against the arm that had threatened with an impulse new to her misery-hardened heart old marge drew the animal in and closed the window far from resisting the cat nestled against her with every sign of pleasure she's been somebody's pet said the old woman placing her on the floor she ain't always been like this the divine emotion of pity so new to this forlorn creature grew and swelled in her bosom the man at the hall had not lied after all here was another of god's creatures as miserable as herself nay more so for she had a roof to shelter her and she could share it with this homeless one poor puss muttered old marge stroking the rough fur 
You're starving too, ain't you? And I ain't got nothing to give you, not a bite or a sup. Ah. Oh. Her eyes had fallen upon the discarded food. Eagerly she seized it and placed it before the cat. The starving creature gnawed greedily at the bone an instant, then looked up with a hopeless mew. The old woman felt a keener pang of pity. Poor beast, she said with a bitter smile. You can't eat him, can you? No more could I. We're in the same box, puss, old and toothless and nobody belonging to us. We'll have to starve together, I guess, and it's Christmas Day. Did you know that, puss? Christmas Day, Lord, Lord. The cat rubbed against her skirts, her eyes fixed upon her benefactors. Seems to understand every word I say, old Marge muttered. If only I had a drop of milk for her now. Hobbling to the stove, she examined the battered tin can, letting the moonlight shine into its rusty depths. A little water or tea remained in it, and with this she moistened some of the bread and placed it before the cat, which devoured it now eagerly. Then she took the animal in her arms and laid herself down on the mattress, drawing the ragged covers over them. The cat nestled against her side, the warmth of the two poor bodies mingled, and both slept. The moon ray crept along and spread itself over the heap of rags, the knotted fingers resting on the cat's rough fur, the seamed old face. It passed away, the morning dawned, and a peal of bells and the sound of footsteps on the pavement below, and still the two slept on. Angela stood near the door, receiving her Christmas guests. They came straggling in in twos and threes, some boldly and impudently, some shamefaced and shy, some eager, some indifferent, but all poverty-pinched. Each one was pleasantly welcomed and passed on to the feast. Angela watched and waited, and at last the door opened slowly to admit old Marge who stopped short on the threshold with a look at once stubborn, appealing, suspicious, ashamed. Like a wild animal on the alert for the faintest sign of repulsion or danger, she stood there. But Angela only smiled, proffering her white soft hand, destitute of jewels but the hand of a lady. "'A Merry Christmas,' she said brightly. "'I was ugly to you last night.' said old Marge, huskily, ignoring the beautiful hand she dared not touch. "'Never mind,' Angela answered sweetly. "'You were tired.' "'I am a bad old woman,' said old Marge, mistrustfully. "'Never mind that either,' said Angela. "'Let me be your friend. "'If you will, you shall never be cold or hungry again.' A profound wonder came into the old face. Then it began to writhe, and from each eye oozed scant tears, seeking a channel, amid the seams and wrinkles of the sunken cheeks. "'You will let me be your friend,' urged Angela. Still old Marge wept silently, the scant tears of age. "'You shall have a pleasant home, and—' A swift, suspicious glance darted from the wet eyes. "'Not asylum, miss, please,' said the old woman. No, said Angela quietly, not an asylum, a home, a bright, clean, comfortable home. I can work, miss, put in old Marge, doubling her knotted hands to show their strength. I can wash and scrub. Yes, said Angela, you may work all you are able, helping to keep things clean and comfortable. Still old Marge looked doubtful. Wiping her cheeks with a corner of her shawl, she half turned toward the door. "'You have a family, or anyone belonging to you?' asked Angela, thinking to have reached the root of the difficulty. "'Yes,' said the old woman stoutly. "'I have a cat. Where I go, she must go too.' Angela patted the grimy hand with a laugh which was good to hear. "'I understand you perfectly,' she said. "'I have a cat of my own.' You and your cat shall not be separated. A half hour later entered the young man Robert. Angela pointed silently to old Marge, sitting in a warm corner, contentedly munching her Christmas dinner. 
"'What have you done to her?' he asked. "'She looks more human already.' Angela laughed again, the same laugh which goes to one's heart so. "'I have adopted her, and her cat,' she answered. "'That's all.'" End of Section 9Section 10 of A Budget of Christmas Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The First Puritan Christmas Tree. Mrs. Olcott called her boys and bade them go to the pine woods and get the finest, handsomest young hemlock tree that they could find get one that is straight and tall with well-bowed branches on it and put it where you can draw it under the woodshed after dark she added the boys went to pine hill and there they picked out the finest young tree on all the hill and said we will take this one so with their hatchets they hewed it down and brought it safely home the next night when all was dark and when roger was quietly sleeping in the adjoining room they dragged the tree into the kitchen it was too tall so they took it out again and cut it off two or three feet at the base then they propped it up and the curtains being down over the windows and blankets being fastened over the curtains to prevent any one looking in and the door being doubly barred to prevent any one coming in they all went to bed very early the next morning while the stars shone on the snow-covered hills the same stars that shone sixteen hundred years before on the hills when christ was born in bethlehem the little puritan mother in new england arose very softly she went out and lit the kitchen fire anew from the ash-covered embers she fastened upon the twigs of the tree the gifts she had bought in boston for her boys and girl then she took as many as twenty pieces of candle and fixed them upon the branches after that she softly called rupert robert and lucy and told them to get up and come into the kitchen hurrying back she began with a bit of a burning stick to light the candles just as the last one was set aflame in trooped the three children before they had time to say a word they were silenced by their mother's warning i wish to fetch roger in and wake him up before it she said keep still until i come back the little lad fast asleep was lifted in a blanket and gently carried by his mother into the beautiful presence see roger my boy see she said arousing him it is christmas morning now in england they only have christmas boughs but here in new england we have a whole christmas tree oh mother he cried oh lucy is it really really true and no dream at all yes i see i see oh mother it is so beautiful were all the trees on all the hills lighted up that way when christ was born and mother he added clapping his little hands with joy at the thought why yes the stars did sing when christ was born they must be glad then and keep christmas too in heaven i know they must and there will be good times there yes said his mother there will be good times there roger then said the boy i shan't mind going now that i've seen the christmas bough i what is that mother what was it that they heard the little Olcott home had never before seemed to tremble so. There were taps at the window, there were knocks at the door, and it was as yet scarcely the break of day. There were voices also shouting something to somebody. "'Shall I put out the candles, mother?' whispered Robert. "'What will they do to us for having the tree? I wish we hadn't it,' regretted Rupert. While Lucy clung to her mother's gown, and shrieked with all her strength it's indians pale and white and still ready to meet her fate stood mrs olcott until 
out of the knocking and the tapping at her door her heart caught a sound it was a voice calling rachel 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 unbar the door she cried back to her boys it's your father calling down came the blankets up went the curtain open flew the door and in walked captain olcott followed by every man and woman in plymouth who had heard at break of day the glorious news that the expected ship had arrived at boston and with it the long-lost captain olcott for an instant nothing was thought of except the joyous welcoming of the captain in his new home what's this what is it what does this mean was asked again and again when the first excitement was past as the tall young pine stood aloft its candles ablaze its gifts still hanging it's welcome home to father said lucy her only thought to screen her mother no child no sternly spoke mrs olcott tell the truth it's a christmas tree faltered poor lucy one and another and another pilgrims and puritans all drew near with faces stern and forbidding and gazed and gazed until one and another and yet another softened slowly into a smile as little roger's piping voice sung out she made it for me mother did but you may have it now and all the pretty things that are on it too because you've brought my father back again if mother will let you he added neither pilgrim nor puritan frowned at the gift one man the sternest there broke off a little twig and said i'll take it for the sake of the good old times at home End of section 10section eleven of a budget of christmas tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b the first christmas in new england by hezekiah butterworth they thought that they had come to their port that day but not yet was their journey done and they drifted away from provincetown bay in the fireless light of the sun with rain and sleet were the tall masts iced and gloomy and chill was in the air but when they looked from the crystal sails to christ and they came to a harbour fair the white hills silent lay for there were no ancient bells to ring no priests to chant no choirs to sing no chapel of baron or lord or king that grey cold winter day the snow came down on the vacant seas and white on the lone rocks lay but rang the axe among the evergreen trees and followed the sabbath day then rose the sun in a crimson haze and the workmen said at dawn shall our axes swing on this day of days when the lord of life was born the white hills silent lay for there were no ancient bells to ring no priests to chant no choirs to sing no chapel of baron or lord or king that grey cold christmas day the old town's bells we seem to hear they are ringing sweet on the dee they are ringing sweet on the harlem mere and sweet on the zyder zee the pines are frosted with snow and sleet shall we our axes wield when the chimes at lincoln are ringing sweet and the bells of osterfield the air was cold and grey and there were no ancient bells to ring no priests to chant no choirs to sing no chapel of baron or lord or king that grey cold christmas day then the master said your axes wield remember ye malabar bay and the covenant there with the lord ye sealed let your axes ring to-day you may talk of the old town's bells to-night when your work for the lord is done and your boats return and the shallop's light shall follow the light of the sun the sky is cold and grey and here are no ancient bells to ring no priest to chant no choirs to sing no chapel of baron or lord or king this grey cold christmas day 
if christ was born on christmas day and the day by him is blessed then low at his feet the evergreens lay and cradle his church in the west emmanuel waits at the temple gates of the nation to-day ye found and the lord delights in no formal rites to-day let your axes sound the sky was cold and gray and there were no ancient bells to ring no priests to chant no choirs to sing no chapel of baron or lord or king that gray cold christmas day their axes rang through the evergreen trees like the bells on the thames and tay and they cheerily sang by the windy seas and they thought of malabar bay on the lonely heights of burial hill the old precisioners sleep but did ever men with a nobler will a holier christmas keep when the sky was cold and gray and there were no ancient bells to ring no priests to chant no choirs to sing no chapel of baron or lord or king that gray cold christmas day end of section eleven